Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening and welcome to Science for the Public's Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight, it's our great pleasure to welcome William Dietrich, Professor of Biochemistry and Marine Biology at Northeastern University in Boston. Dr. Dietrich received his PhD in biology at Yale University. He joined the Northeastern University biology faculty in 1987, and since that time, he's applied his expertise to climate-related evolutionary mutations on the one hand and the development of certain diseases on the other. Dr. Dietrich is a leading researcher on the ice fishes of Antarctica and is a principal investigator in the United States Antarctic program. The Antarctic program has given him an opportunity to do long-range research on evolutionary adaptations, but he's also used his many seasons on the ice in Antarctica to provide outstanding training for his very fortunate graduate students. In addition to these responsibilities, Dr. Dietrich established and served as director of Northeastern University's master's program in bioinformatics. And he applies his medical expertise to appointments at uh, Harvard Medical School and at Children's Hospital. And despite these many obligations, he's authored and co-authored several textbooks. Tonight, Dr. Dietrich will describe the unique evolutionary adaptations of Antarctic ice fishes, and he'll compare the blood and skeletal adaptations that ensure the survival of ice fishes some 30 million years ago with similar changes in humans that signal diseases such as anemia and osteoporosis. His discoveries about the relationship between survival mutations in one organism and indicators of disease in another represent truly innovative science. We are very grateful to Dr. Dietrich for making time available for us in his demanding schedule, and it is a very great honor to welcome him, Dr. Dietrich. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you, Yvonne. It's a pleasure to be here this evening to speak uh, before science for the public. I'm going to speak, be speaking on Antarctica and the organisms that live in the southern ocean around it. And to give you an example of what that southern ocean can be like at times, I have a video that I recorded uh, in 2008 while we were out uh, trawling for fish. Uh, in this case, we had to suspend operations because you can see that the seas were very heavy and the ship was laden with ice. My subject tonight will be Antarctic fishes, models for climate change and human disease. And I would like to introduce the individuals that have been working with me on this over the years. Uh, Craig Albertson at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, John Postlethwaite and Tom Titus at the University of Oregon, Corey Allard, who is an undergraduate in my laboratory and wintered at Palmer Station several years. And most importantly, perhaps, my technician of almost 25 years, Sandra Parker. Uh, she's been able to keep uh, me on the straight and narrow as we conduct our research. I'd also like to fun uh, thank the funding agencies uh, that have supported me over the years. Uh, the National Science Foundation has funded me for uh, about 30 years, and more recently, uh, for our work on osteoporosis, we've been funded by the National Institute on Aging of the NIH. The outline of this presentation will be in four parts. First, I want to describe why study the Antarctic and its organisms, and a little bit about how we do it. Secondly, I'd like to give you the evolutionary history of the southern ocean fishes. Then I'll move into considering the notothenioid fishes and climate change and, and how climate change may interact with these organisms. 
Then finally, I want to describe the relevance of notothenioids, the fish I study, uh, to human disease diseases such as anemia and osteoporosis. This is uh, Pagetopsis macropterus. This is an example of an Antarctic ice fish. I will return to uh, this later, but I want to give you a little hint of what's coming. This fish has no red blood cells and no hemoglobin for transporting oxygen, yet it, it thrives in the Southern Ocean. So the question is, why does it thrive and what happened to render it uh, absent of uh, erythrocytes and hemoglobin. But first, we're going to do a little um, slide journey through some of the uh, uh, features of the Antarctic. It's an incredibly uh, beautiful place. Uh, the Antarctic is um, a virtually pristine natural laboratory for studying uh, many different disciplines from biology all the way to studying the cosmos, which is done at the South Pole. Uh, as you can see, the very, very frequently you have these absolutely lovely images around. This is an iceberg that I watched turn turtle and expose the undersurface where you can see where the water has been melting away the ice. This is an uh, image of uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, which has mountains about four or 5,000 feet tall. And uh, then I'd like to show you some of the organisms. These are Antarctic fur seals. Um, in the late or the early 1800s, around 1830, sealers from uh, Britain, Russia, and the United States uh, had virtually uh, wiped out these creatures. Uh, now there are some three or four million uh, southern fur seals uh, in the Antarctic, protected under the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, and these are animals are interesting because they went through a, a genetic uh, bottleneck that may have been as small as a, a surviving population of 100 seals before the rebound uh, took effect. Uh, these are daily penguins. The daily penguins are telling us quite a bit uh, about climate change. Uh, they need sea ice in order to uh, live and uh, they're heading south along the Antarctic Peninsula because the waters to the north are warming up. Uh, this snotty-nosed fellow is a southern elephant seal, uh, another of the seals of the Antarctic. This is um, the leopard seal, and uh, you probably can guess why it's, it's called the leopard seal. It's spotted and it has uh, rather fearsome dentition. Here we have um, a humpback whale and a this was uh, taken uh, on a trip when I was uh, fishing with the uh, Antarctic Marine Living Resources uh, group of the Antarctic. And we had a friendly humpback come by and spy hop and breach and so on. We also, there are a number of uh, invertebrates that are in the Southern Ocean. This is an isopod called Glyptonotus antarcticus, uh, which is often said to take the place of, the, of a crab uh, in the ecosystem. This is a sea mouse, Aphrodite, a polychaete worm, and here is a uh, nice little octopus that uh, we caught in one of our trawls. So having seen some of the organisms, all of which are basically focused on the sea for making a living, uh, the question is, uh, first question I will ask has to do with uh, how will uh, warming of the Southern Ocean affect these organisms, their populations and interactions between populations, uh, and what will be the outcome uh, for the trophic system. I'd also like to introduce you to some of the equipment that we use. Uh, this is the Antarctic Research and Support Vessel, the Lawrence M. Gould. Uh, we use this as a fishing platform, but more generally it serves the Palmer Station area for a whole range of uh, different scientific projects. If you work on the continent, you will frequently be transported by C-130 Hercules. This is a, a ski-equipped version of the aircraft, so it can land in the field wherever it has uh, sufficiently uh, flat ice to land on. 
Palmer Station is shown here, the, the major buildings, and uh, tied up at the pier is the Lawrence M. Gould. Uh, we do many of our studies at uh, Palmer Station. Uh, we have very fine uh, laboratory facilities there, and we can take and keep our fish that we've captured alive in aquaria and then work with them as necessary to perform our experiments. This is uh, another requirement for any successful research program. You need to have personnel. Um, and here I am standing with Corey Allard. I've already mentioned him. He was a Northeastern undergraduate who performed the first uh, co-op in Antarctica, the seventh continent. Uh, so he became very uh, famous uh, at Northeastern. I've had a number of uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, and colleagues from around the world work with me uh, over the years uh, at Palmer. I also had the uh, unique opportunity to go to the South Pole, actually the very first year that I went to Antarctica in 1981. So this is about a, a 30 year younger version of me that you're seeing at the pole. Let's look at how the um, Antarctic um, evolved how uh, the continent became separated from uh, other land masses and how it ultimately uh, became isolated in a very cold southern ocean. Well, about uh, 55 million years ago, the connection between the, uh, the peninsula of the Antarctic and the tip of South America began to break apart. And by 25 million years ago, the Drake Passage had opened and this permitted the formation of a circumpolar current around the Antarctic that led to thermal isolation of the Southern Ocean. And the Southern Ocean then began to cool fairly dramatically so that by 10 to 14 million years ago, it was below about five uh, degrees centigrade. And at the present time, it's well oxygenated very thermally stable and temperatures in the surface waters are generally between plus 1.5 and minus 1.9 degrees centigrade. Minus 1.9 degrees centigrade is the freezing point of natural seawater. Well, what happened to the fish species uh, as this uh, process of cooling was occurring? This illustrates the um, the fossil record that we know for fishes in the Antarctic uh, during the period shown in the green box at the top, approximately half of the Eocene epoch. At that time, uh, many different types of sharks, uh, skates, uh, herrings, catfishes, and so on were present in the ocean, and the temperature was about 15 or 20 degrees centigrade. But at the Transition between the Eocene and the Oligocene, about 15 to 30, uh, 15, excuse me, 30 to 40 million years ago, um, most of the uh, species that are shown on this table disappear from the fossil record. So they became locally extinct. They didn't become extinct, in fact, but they had simply left the area. And that li left two groups of fishes, uh, the notothenioids that I'm going to speak about, and the rajidae or skates. Um, available to uh, occupy the vacant uh, ecological niches that were present. So we can say that about 35 to 40 million years ago, most uh, temperate fishes disappear, but the notothenioid, the notothenioid fishes stick around. Okay, why study notothenioids then? Well, there's a number of reasons that I can enumerate. The first is they're an excellent example of evolution in an extreme environment. They are also the best described marine species flock that we know of. A, a species flock is a group of organisms that have rapidly radiated from a last common ancestor to give rise to a disparate group of species in a very short time frame. The hallmark of the radiation of the notothenioids is secondary pelagicism. Uh, the ancestor of this group lacked a swim bladder and was not able to move in the water column very easily to take advantage of the food resources there. Secondary pelagici pelagicism here has been achieved by the evolution of reduced bone mineral density and the accumulation of lipids. I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
We also see in the uh, notothenoids uh, examples of evolutionary gain of function, uh, very novel. For example, the appearance of antifreeze glycoproteins to protect the fluids and tissues of the fish from freezing. We also see evolutionary losses of function. So red blood cells and hemoglobin have been lost in the ice fishes, and most of the notothenoids seem to lack a heat shock response. The heat shock response is a protective response uh, to a rapid increase in body temperature, which will tend to cause proteins to lo lose their natural biochemical activity. The heat shock proteins then are induced to rescue these damaged proteins and fold them back up so they can um, uh, function normally. And as a, an example uh, to you in the audience, if you have a fever of 105 Fahrenheit degrees, your brain is busily making uh, heat shock proteins to rescue the damage proteins caused by the fever. We also consider the um, notothenoids to be nice models for uh, a variety of human diseases, and I'll talk about those today. And then finally, they're sentinel vertebrates for global climate change. These fish occupy trophic level somewhere in the midst of the, uh, the food web, uh, eating smaller animals and organisms, and in turn serving as prey for larger organisms such as orcas and uh, seals. So let's take a look at climate change in the Antarctic and um, what we can say. Uh, Let's first take a look at what happened during the past 50 million years. Since the Eocene, um, which occurred, was part of the 50 million years ago, the Southern Ocean began cooling at a rate of about four tenths of a degree centigrade per million years. And that accelerated in the Miocene uh, twofold uh, until we have the present uh, cold, icy conditions in the ocean. Okay, what about the past 50 years? Well, in the past 50 years, the air temperature on the west coast of Peninsula, where Palmer Station is located, has increased 3 degrees centigrade in the summer and has increased 6 degrees centigrade in the winter. In the, I've spent many uh, Junes and Julys winter in the Antarctic at Palmer Station, and um, when I started, that was the time when you had blizzards. Uh, now, typically, it rains, and the, the average uh, Palmer Station winter is not much different from a winter in Boston. We know that the upper southern ocean temperature, about the upper 100 meters or so west of the peninsula, in 50 years has increased one centigrade degree. That is astounding. That's, that tells us that in 200 uh, more years, it will be up uh, another two degrees centigrade. And this is, will have important implications for the uh, organisms that are living in the water. The mid-depth temperature, down around 1,000 meters or so, uh, of the Antarctic circumpolar current has increased two-tenths of a degree centigrade. And we also know that eastern Antarctica, the portion where McMurdo Station resides, is also starting to warm slowly. So we have, in general, a picture of polar warming uh, in the summit, southern hemisphere, and especially uh, in the area of the Antarctic Peninsula. This uh, illustration here is uh, from NASA. Uh, they have a heat bar at the bottom. Uh, deep blue means cooling at a rate of two-tenths of a degree per year. Uh, deep red means warming at a rate of two-tenths of a degree centigrade per year. And I think it's very clear that along the Antarctic Peninsula to the upper left, uh, the ocean is warming at a rather dramatic rate. So here's our ultimate climate change nightmare. Uh, penguins live in a cold, icy desert right now. Uh, the ultimate nightmare would be if they were uh, somehow forced to exist in a warm, dry desert. So let's take a look at how the Antarctic uh, fishes will respond to global warming. And the way that I chose to do this was to study the embryology of these fish. This is a um, fish called commonly the bullhead notothen. Uh, its formal name is Notothenia creoseps. This is a female that is gravid and has about 3,000 eggs 
that she's ready to uh, spawn. Uh, these, this species is a broadcast spawner, so um, a male will swim around and fertilize the eggs externally. Uh, this may be a little difficult to see, but this is one of our tanks. Uh, in, we're maintaining uh, embryos um, that are floating at the top of the water. Uh, these eggs are um, uh, positively buoyant, so they do tend to collect the surface or under the sea ice. In fact, uh, living under the sea ice is probably very important for their survival. The major take home message about the development of Antarctic fish embryos is that they develop very slowly. It takes approximately eight to nine months for a typical species to go from fertili fertilization to hatching and becoming a larval fish that can feed on its own. So typically the fish spawn in the spring, um, or the, excuse me, the fall, uh, somewhere in March, and the embryos that develop over the winter will then hatch with the return of spring in September and October and the return of sunlight. So will the, the rising temperature of the Southern Ocean perturb development? The way we've approached this question is to take clutches of eggs and uh, raise them at different temperatures. And here I'm showing the normal temperature of minus two centigrade and uh, a experimental elevated temperature of plus five degrees centigrade. And what I'd like you to do is uh, look at the embryo on the bottom right that's at one month um, of two degrees uh, development. That embryo is at what we call the bud stage. If you look at the embryo that corresponds to it uh, in the experimental treatment, uh, the bud stage was reached in one week. So at five degrees centigrade, these organisms, these embryos are developing about four times more rapidly than they would at their normal temperature. But we can say that five degrees, and as long as we followed it, development appears normal. So in some sense, that's a good message. Uh, these embryos have the ability to develop at um, five degrees. I mentioned the heat shock response previously. Uh, these organisms uh, do not have a heat shock response, and that's shown on the uh, microarrays that are shown at the bottom. There are a few notothenioids that live outside of the Antarctic and live at uh, temperate temperatures. Uh, the one on the left is the Tristan clipfish, and it can live at temperatures as high as 27 degrees centigrade, which is rather remarkable. Uh, Notothenia creoseps, we've already met, it lives typically at minus two. Um, the various um, rectangles here show um, areas of the microarray uh, which various genes have been uh, spotted. And you'll notice that a number of them say HSP for heat shock protein. There's HSP 108, HSP 70, HSP 90, so on. This family of proteins that are inducible to rescue proteins that have been denatured by uh, abnormally high temperature. We can see in the case of uh, the Tristan clipfish that there's a lot of red rectangles that represents uh, very high induction of the genes for the heat shock proteins. The fish on the right, the bullhead notothen, uh, doesn't show uh, much in the way of induction at all. Basically, the squares are mostly gray or black, which is indicative of no change in expression at all. So there is, is not a protective heat shock response. Um, the next question is, does the, the, do the Antarctic fishes change their gene expression in any way at all when they're challenged by high temperature? And it turns out that they do. Uh, we are now studying um, trans, the transcriptome that is expressed uh, by the fish and by the embryos uh, as they develop, and we're doing it both at uh, normal temperature and at elevated temperature. Again, it's a comparison of minus two to plus four or so. And this shows uh, that when you take a, an adult rock cod or bullhead notothen, like I showed you previously, 
uh, and warm it from uh, minus 2 to plus 4 degrees. You do get the induction of a number of genes, and at after 24 hours, approximately 32 percent of the genes have responded by an increase in production of mRNA uh, to this heat insult. We're still trying to understand uh, how this change is protective to the organism, so there'll be more information that will come in the future. So to conclude, Antarctic fishes have um, evolved uh, to be what we call stenothermal uh, over approximately 10 million years. Stenothermal simply means that they are restricted to life in a relatively narrow range of temperatures. We've established that embryos can uh, develop at temperatures as high as 5 degrees, but we suspect that 8 degrees uh, it would be a lethal uh, developmental temperature. Antarctic fishes lack a classical heat shock response, but they do respond with changes in gene expression to thermal challenge. If, will the Antarctic fishes be able to acclimatize to uh, projected warming scenarios? Uh, probably some of them will, uh, and, and that's good news. Problem for the embryos that develop, however, or recall that I mentioned that they develop over the winter and they hatch in the spring when sunlight returns. Well, that sunlight stimulates the production of phytoplankton, which then in turn feeds zooplankton, and the, the fish eat, the larval fish eat phytoplankton and zooplankton. If they're developing four times more rapidly, uh, that means they're going to hatch in the winter and they may become decoupled from their food. They arrive uh, on the scene, it's still dark out, it's still a lot of ice, there's not a lot of phytoplankton and zooplankton, so perhaps they would be in a situation where they would starve. Okay, so that's the uh, first element of the, the science that I wanted to talk about. The, uh, ability of uh, Antarctic fish embryos to uh, handle thermal challenge. I'd like to move now to discuss how the Antarctic fishes are relevant to human diseases. In 2009, uh, John Postlethwaite and uh, several other colleagues and I wrote an article about the notothenioid fishes and other organisms and pointed out how they could serve as mutant models for human diseases. The premises of this mutant mo model hypothesis are, first, and we're very confident of this, um, invertebrates all the way from uh, sharks and uh, fishes all the way to us, uh, genetic pathways are generally conserved. So if we understand what happens in a fish, it's relevant to human health. The second uh, criterion is that whether a genetically programmed trait is subject to positive or negative selection depends upon the environmental context in which that trait is being expressed. So for example, um, for if Antarctic fishes without a swim bladder were to reduce their bone mineral density, what condition we call osteopenia, they could go up in the water column, uh, but if we lose bone mineral density, we get uh, bones that are easily fractured under one gravity acceleration on the surface of the planet. So the, whether a trait is positively or negatively selected, whether it's adaptive or not, very much depends on the environmental context. So traits that are adaptive in non-human vertebrates, like the anemia of ice fishes that I will address, and low bone mineral density uh, can help us to understand the genetics of maladapted human diseases. In a nutshell, odd phenotypes mimic human diseases. And here are four examples. The ice fish shown at the bottom looking at the gills. You can see the gills lack any crimson color. They are, have no hemoglobin and no red blood cells. The Mexican cave fish have evolved for millions of years in the absence of sunlight. They don't need eyes. They actually start during development to make eyes, but it, when they reach the retinal stage, they begin to regress and the eyes disappear. So this is an example of retinal degeneration. 
Heterotopic ossification. Well, alligators do this just fine, uh, but if you develop bone on your skin, that's a very abnormal condi condition. And finally, um, the osteopenia that I've mentioned, uh, I'm showing here a, um, a jawbone from the ice fish, which is staining blue because it's mostly uh, collagen, uh, compared to a heavily mineralized uh, bone from a red-blooded relative. So the ice fish here are expressing an osteopenic condition. Uh, osteopenia is bad for humans. It's great for the ice fish because it allows it to move more easily in the water column. In the rest of the work, I'm going to talk about two uh, species, primarily in the context of their blood phenotypes. This is the bullhead notothen, Notothenia creoseps. Here's a look at its gills, and you can clearly see that the gills have a brilliant crimson color. And uh, this is the site at which oxygen is being taken up by red cells and uh, it binds to hemoglobin for transport to the tissues. Kinocephalus aceronis is an ice fish, and we'll often refer to them as white-blooded fishes because they, they lack the red blood we see for the other notothenioids. And if we look at their gills, we see they have a very creamy complexion no red blood cells, no hemoglobin. And here I've drawn some blood from uh, Notothenia rossii, a close relative of the previous fish. You can see it, it's brilliant crimson, 35% of the uh, volume of that uh, blood is composed of red blood cells. And you can see the translucent blood of the ice fish in comparison. That blood is translucent because it, it has white blood cells. The uh, components of the uh, immune system that are normal to all vertebrates, and these cells are scattering light. So we can say that the ice fishes are profoundly anemic, and if we can study the genes that are not expressed, we can find genes that the ice fish don't express, uh, but the rock cod or notothen does express, these are putative genes uh, involved in the making of red blood cells. Okay, the, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the hematology of the ice fishes. Um, the modern description of ice fish blood was performed by uh, Johann Rude, a Norwegian, and he published it in 1954 in Nature. He showed that the uh, ice fishes that he was working with were devoid of hemoglobin. They didn't have any red cells. They did have white cells, 1% leukocytes by volume. Uh, they uh, apparently lived on oxygen that was physically dissolved in their serum and based on comparison to a red-blooded fish of comparable weight, that means the ice fish has about 10% of the oxygen carrying capacity per unit volume of blood. Now that sounds like it's not very much, um, so how do, does the uh, ice fish get along? Are there changes that the ice fishes have undergone physiologically that help to compensate for this? Well, we do know that uh, there are some negative consequences uh, to losing your red blood cells. I should mention the positive consequence is that they don't have to circulate a very viscous blood uh, because uh, the red-blooded animals, uh, red blood cells uh, develop very high viscosity, require a lot of energy to pump in cold fluids. Well, uh, the ice fishes have some compensatory adaptations. They have very large hearts and expanded vasculature and an increased blood volume. They also can exchange uh, gas uh, through very large uh, gills. They're much larger than the gills of red-blooded animals. They also can take up about 40% of the oxygen directly through their skin, which is scaleless, so cutaneous respiration uh, enables them to uh, augment their oxygen. And then finally, they have reduced uh, the absolute demand of, uh, for oxygen a little bit um, by re reducing aer aerobic metabolic rates. Well, a um, natural question to ask uh, for, of the ice fishes is what has happened to their globin genes? Uh, if they are not expressing uh, hemoglobin, they presumably don't have globin genes that are under positive selection pressure, and, 
And without positive selection pressure, um, they might just um, uh, fall apart. They might become genetic uh, remnants, and uh, we wanted to find out what, what had become of them. So we performed a, uh, an analysis in which we take the, the whole genomic DNA of a fish and we cut it with an enzyme and we run it on a gel that separates the DNA based on uh, size and we then expose uh, this gel to a radioactive probe for the gene that we're interested in and what we're looking to see is whether it detects a fragment of DNA in the gel. And if it does, that fragment of DNA indicates that the gene is present in the genome of that fish. So here we have done southern analyses for alpha globin on the left and beta globin on the right. The three species here whose uh, abbreviations begin with C are, are ice fishes, and the other four species are red-blooded relatives. For alpha globin, what you can see is a, is a detectable band for each of these species indicating that they have at least some part of an alpha globin gene in their genome. If you look at the right-hand panel for beta globin, you can see that there's no signal for any of the ice fishes. It's, this is very strong presumptive evidence that the beta globin gene has been lost from the genome. So we were, we were very intrigued by these um, observations and we decided that we would pursue the genes for all of the ice fishes and um, see what uh, was present, what fraction of uh, the alpha or beta globin genes were present in these organisms. And we came up with the results that are shown here. Um, Essentially, 15 of the 16 species have lost the entire beta globin gene and most of the alpha globin gene, and they have the small fragment shown on the uh, bottom left. But one of these species, the remaining species, uh, Neopagetopsis iona, has a corrupted globin gene locus that contains an alpha globin gene and portions of two phyletically distinct beta globin genes. Well, this is evidence then that homologous or non-homologous recombination has disrupted this gene locus, probably leading to its failure to function in the ancestral ice fish. And then that gene was no longer, no longer under selective pressure and um, it could um, kick out pieces of DNA without any consequence. And uh, we got perhaps one fragment uh, shown in the bottom left produced, and then we had a couple of different genes, corrupted genes for the globin complex, circulating in the ice fish population as the species derived. So the, in fact, Notothenia, uh, excuse me, Neopagetopsis iona, uh, the one illustrated here with the corrupted locus, is the smoking gun that shows us how the globin genes were lost. This was actually the 16th species that we examined. Uh, so we were um, <clears throat> very concerned that we had some sort of artifact and we waited a year until we got another specimen from a different part of the Antarctic and confirmed this finding uh, before we published it. Now the Antarctic ice fishes have lost their globin genes um, it's clear, and an important conclusion is that they basically have no chance of gaining them back. Let's think what this means in the context of uh, global warming. An animal that doesn't have the ability to transport oxygen with red cells and hemoglobin is probably going to be uh, at a greater disadvantage uh, than organisms that do have red blood cells. So now we would like to compare the development of ice fish embryos to uh, the bullhead notothen embryos to see if there is a differential uh, thermal sensitivity. Finally, um, I'm going to ask the question, can we use the ice fish system to discover genes that are involved in erythropoiesis? Uh, the answer is that yes, we used a technique in 2000 called representational difference analysis. This technique is uh, way out of date now, 
but uh, it allowed us to clone a number of genes, and I'll talk about some of them here, um, by essentially putting DNA from the ice fish, doesn't make red blood cells together, with DNA from a red cell making fish, you allow the DNAs to anneal and you throw away everything that they share and you clone the pieces that remain. The pieces that remain are the genes that the red-blooded species is expressing and the white-blooded species is not. And those then become presumptive genes that are involved in making red cells. So we discovered um, the hepcidin precursor this way. Uh, it was already known to be involved in red cell formation. LIGDI is known to be involved in red cell formation. We also picked up hemogen, which has been poorly studied, uh, but is now known to have some red cell function. And we picked up bloodthirsty, which was an absolute unknown at the time. So to study how these genes work, we need to be able to work in a genetically tractable system. And that means we take our discoveries from the Antarctic fish and move it to the zebrafish, which has become a very important model for uh, developmental genetics of vertebrates. There are a number of advantages to using the zebrafish. First, its embryos are clear, so you can study them microscopically. Uh, they have high fecundity, uh, laying 200 eggs in a mating. They have a short generation time, two to three months to sexual maturity, so you can do mutagenic experiments on them. There are thousands of developmental mutants that have now been described. And we can also do transgenesis on these fish. Uh, so if we wanted, for instance, to put an antarctic fish gene into the zebrafish to see what it would do, we have that capability. So um, to evaluate the functions of the genes that we discovered by representational difference analysis, what we have done is to clone and study their orthologs, or the same gene, in the zebrafish. And the one I'm going to tell you about briefly is bloodthirsty. Uh, bloodthirsty is a protein that belongs to a very large family called the trim family. There are about 75 different human genes uh, in the trim family. And uh, we wondered what might bloodthirsty correspond to. And when we did the bioinformatic analyses, we came up with two answers, trim 27 and trim 39. There was no reason to pick one or the other, so we had to test both of them. To evaluate the function of bloodthirsty in the zebrafish, um, we did clone the zebrafish bloodthirsty gene and showed that it was about 60% identical to that of the bullhead notothen. And uh, we then produced the bloodthirsty protein, or we blocked the production of the bloodthirsty protein in zebrafish using a reverse genetic strategy, uh, one that makes use of morpholino oligonucleotides. What do morpholino oligonucleotides do? They, they bind to a messenger RNA that's going to be translated into a protein. And they bind so stably that they, pre they prevent that translation, so you don't get the protein. So what you do is you design one morpholino oligo, or MO, that's designed to block the production of the protein, and you design a control morpholino that is designed so that it won't bind efficiently to the messenger RNA, and you compare it to an uninjected uh, animal. And here we have a wild type uninjected animal on the left, a control animal on the right, and an experimental animal on the bottom. The important thing to note here is that the wild-type animal is producing red blood cells, as shown by the red staining of the cells as they pour over the oak and enter the heart. The control animal also produces wild-type levels of uh, red blood cells, but the experimentally treated animal, shown in the bottom, is producing few, if any, red blood cells. The gold standard for testing whether the knockdown is specific is to try to rescue the knockdown with a synthetic messenger RNA for the protein that you're wanting to see its effect. And this synthetic RNA has the uh, um, characteristic that it cannot be 
um, recognized by the Morpholino. So in these panels, uh, upper left, we have a wild type animal. Uh, right hand up panel, uh, Morpholino knockdown, we don't see red blood cells. And the two bottom panels, we've injected the Morpholino to knock down the natural transcript, but inje injected with it uh, the synthetic uh, bloodthirsty transcript. And you see that in both cases, we get the restoration of red blood cell production. Now the question is, which of the mammalian trims corresponds to bloodthirsty? In this uh, uh, experiment, we've done the same thing as we did in the previous one, but we're going to try to rescue with mouse trim 27. And as you can see from the bottom two panels, the Morpholino knockdown can be rescued by trim 27. If we use human trim 39, which is basically identical to mouse trim 39, we don't see rescue. Panels C and D have no uh, blood visible and are just like the experimental knockdown shown in panel B. And finally, we uh, have been able to show that uh, trim 27 shown by the blue bars is expressed in various uh, blood forming tissues of the mouse embryo uh, and adult, including the yolk sac, uh, the fetal liver, uh, and the bone marrow. Uh, and it's expressed in a, a fa declining fashions that would suggest that it is um, somehow uh, responsible for putting a break on the red cell progenitor and that the destruction of the protein then releases this break and allows the differentiation of the red cell to occur. At the same time, in the green bars, you can see that trim 39 is not being expressed in the mouse tissues to any appreciable extent. So, conclusions. Um, the Antarctic ice fishes provide a unique evolutionary resource for isolating genes involved in erythropoiesis. We've identified the gene bloodthirsty, which we think encodes a class of protein called an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and in fact is involved, uh, potentially involved in the destruction of proteins. Uh, bloodthirsty is required for terminal differentiation of the erythroid progenitor. We think by relieving a block to differentiation by destroying some inhibitory protein. And finally, TRIM27 is likely to be the mammalian orthologue of zebrafish bloodthirsty. With that, uh, I'd like to say cheers. Uh, we have a practice at Palmer Station of uh, jumping in uh, during Midwinter's Day. Uh, and uh, this was June 21st, uh, approximately 15 years ago. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, it probably would survive. Um, th uh, there's a little bit of a complication uh, in that there are two distinct stages of making red blood cells. There's an early stage uh, of making what are called primitive red cells. And then uh, in the adult, uh, you make definitive blood cells. So all the work that I've shown you indicates that blood for bloodthirsty is involved in suppressing the formation of the primitive blood cells. We don't yet know whether it is also involved in preventing uh, definitive progenitors from differentiating. I should also mention, though, that there, is a, there are natural mutants in uh, zebrafish uh, that you can maintain as heterozygotes, and if you mate them, you get 25% homozygotes that don't make red blood, red blood cells. And if you treat them as if they're in an intensive care by providing them with uh, saturated oxygen 
uh, water uh, saturated with oxygen. Uh, you can raise those embryos the four days it takes before the adult program of red cells uh, formation turns on. And then you can actually uh, rear ad adults that uh, are uh, homozygous for this otherwise lethal mutation in an embryo. Uh, since other, um, the sharks and all left when, um, thanks for getting, is there any indication that fish from northern oceans that are getting too hot will start going down to the Antarctic where it's still relatively cool? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, the answer de depends upon the, the depth strata of the fish that you're talking about. Uh, the most notothenioid fishes live at 1,000 meters or less, and we consider that to be coastal fishes. Uh, and the same is true in the north. Most of our, our cold living fishes live at relatively shallow uh, uh, depths. So, Assuming that they aren't able to get down into the abyss, down, you say, 7,000 meters where the water is quite cold, they would have to go from cold through tropical water uh, to the cold in order to get to the southern hemisphere. On the other hand, the ab abyssal fishes, the fish that live down uh, at depths of seven to 10,000 meters, uh, these fishes are cosmopolitan from the north to the south. Uh, so they, they, there's no barrier for them to migrate back and forth. Uh, but in terms of the, the fish that live closer to the, the top, the surface of the ocean, uh, there is this intermediate barrier. And that has led to the development of the notothenioids only in the southern hemisphere. There are no notothenioid fishes in the northern hemisphere. Um, similarly, cods are prevalent in the northern hemisphere, but we do not have any cods in the Antarctic. So um, this, uh, this thermal barrier has pre prevented uh, the integration or the migration of these species in both directions. I, I, it sounds as though the more radical a mutation, the more fragile it might make an organism ultimately. Is that a general truth or? In other words, they can't adjust after that. Right. So the, there are various um, classes of mutations, and, and the one that I uh, was describing for the loss of the hemoglobin was deletion, where a large segment of DNA has been lost, and therefore there's uh, uh, basically a vanishingly small probability that uh, they would ever able to be able to recover that fragment. There are also point mutations of various kinds where a single nucleotide in a gene changes, and that can lead to loss of gene function. Uh, if that gene remains non-functional uh, over a long period of time, it could also be lost. But with being a single change, there is also the possibility for reversion uh, to occur to the wild type gene sequence. It also depends on whether the gene that you're dealing with is dominant or negative in terms of uh, its uh, producing a character trait uh, in the, the organism. Thank you very much. I've um, always had an interest in science, and uh, when I went to uh, university, I decided that I would major in science, uh, but I wasn't really certain uh, what uh, particular one that I wanted to study. And I took a lot of chemistry, math, physics, and so on, ended up taking a major in psychology uh, and realizing that I probably didn't want to go to graduate school in psychology. And uh, quite fortunately, I had taken an introductory biology course in my senior year, and I had a professor who profoundly influenced me because she was such a good teacher of molecular biology. And I became fascinated with these little intercellular uh, filaments called microtubules. The microtubules are part of a mitotic spindle. They're responsible for separating the chromosomes that contain the genetic information. 
And I thought, wow, this is really great stuff. And so she would put me in touch with the Yale um, biology department. They admitted me into biology with a psychology major. Uh, so I struggled a little bit and getting up to the terminology and so on. Uh, but I was really very happy. And I think this is an example of serendipity uh, and taking advantages of, offer, of opportunities that come your way. Uh, and so I studied microtubules as a graduate student, as a postdoctoral fellow, and so on. When another opportunity came along, and that was uh, an invitation to join a research group in Antarctica. And as they say, the rest is history. I went to the Antarctic. I found, you know, these fascinating, wonderful organisms that were there, this incredible ecosystem based in the ocean around ice. And I've been studying it uh, ever since. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be funded uh, for 30 years by the National Science Foundation to conduct this research. Uh, the most exciting thing uh, when I conduct research is um, uh, being able to take together uh, disparate data and assemble them and understand what the, the results uh, mean. An example of this is the work that uh, I've done on the ice fish and understanding how the ice fish lost the capacity to uh, synthesize hemoglobin. Uh, we conducted a number of studies sequencing the DNA of these organisms to find out what had happened to the globin genes. And uh, the data for a while was quite confusing uh, until uh, we sort of had an aha moment and understood how to put the data together and synthesize it for uh, publication. Uh, my approach to teaching uh, is to emphasize um, concept-based learning and to the ability to manipulate concepts uh, rather than uh, simply learning uh, all the information that's available in the modern textbook. Well, that's clearly impossible the, these days. So uh, my approach is to try to emphasize problem solving, making use of data uh, uh, from a, a research article, uh, interpreting that data. I also enjoy uh, teaching writing. Uh, writing in scientific terms is a rather unique skill. Um, and if the students that I have are going to go on to a career in science, medicine, uh, whatever uh, professional discipline they may take up, they're going to need to be able to convey their thoughts clearly and succinctly. I uh, have toyed with the idea of uh, producing a book for uh, the popular audience. Uh, there are some out there uh, that are quite compelling reads, uh, but I, and I may do so at some time in the future.